So I guess I'll start over a little bit. My name is James Long. I work for the de developer ecosystem team. Um, so I'm going to show you Mortar. It's at github.com slash mozilla slash mortar. Um, mortar itself is just a collection of templates. So we actually have four different templates right now. There's an app stub template, a game stub, a list detail, and a tab view template. Um, the app stub template is kind of probably the main one that you should use right now um, because it kind of just comes with a, it's kind of what um, Robert was showing before. Some, it's, it's a boilerplate project that doesn't come with much. It doesn't come with any content, um, but it comes with an index.html and it comes with a project structure that is already pre-built pre um, so that you can just go ahead and start working with it. Um, I'll click down into it so that you can see. It's not too small. Um, you can see that the, the base folder is kind of weird. Like, you don't see any of your static files. All of those are in the www directory. Um, the reason for that is most apps are going to end up being like this anyway because you're going to want to use some tool that is managing your project or you have a server-side component, and that's going to live one level up from your actual static files. Um, most of the other boilerplates, I think, have their static files in the actual root folder, which just makes it a little bit more approachable. It doesn't seem as scary. Um, but for for Volo or for um, Mortar, uh, it it comes with it comes with something called Volo, which requires it to be structured like this. And you can pretty much ignore the node modules in the tools directory. Those are just node things for uh, for Volo. Um, so Mortar comes with Volo, like I said, it comes with RequireJS, which is a JavaScript module system, and then just a few JavaScript libraries and like four lines of CSS. And that's that's about it. Um, the most important things that it comes with, at least for the app stuff template, which is the the Blink template is Volo and RequireJS because we think that RequireJS is, is a good way to write JavaScript. Um, and another note for Mortar too is that we are currently act currently actively developing it. We're still trying to figure out the right balance between what we should give you guys, how opinionated should it be. Um, so in three months, it could look a little bit different. So I, I think I'm going to show you Volo because that's probably the thing that's the least heard about. Um, it was written by the same guy, James Burke, who actually works 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 for Mozilla, um, and he, he it's the same guy who wrote RequireJS. Um, Volo is basically like Grunt, if you've heard of Grunt. It's just a, a command line tool to manage your project, and it simply has different commands like Volo create, Volo add, um, and a few a few other ones, and you can also write your own commands, and it's just it's just no JS code. So if you wanted to write a command that, um, you know, makes thumbnails of a bunch, or makes, makes thumbnails of a bunch of images in a directory or something like that, um, you could say Volo create thumbnails, and you, that's all you would have to type with the CLI, um, and it would just automatically do it. So we use Volo for a lot of cool things. Um, so I'm, I'm actually going to start an app for you guys. Um, it's going to be interesting doing this one-handed. But um, so I'm going to type. Is that is that big enough for you guys? Let's see. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to type Volo create, which creates a project based off of a current template. So I'm going to say um, my app. And then it takes several different forms. And I think always they usually come from GitHub. Um, but I can just type a GitHub repository reference, which is username slash and then the name of the repository. And Mozilla slash mortar. list detail. Um, if, I just, if I just do that, then I'll get, get an app called my app based off of the more list detail template. It's as simple as that. I hope my internet is actually connected to the right one. Um, it is. Maybe I think it was just slow. OK. Um, so now if I cd in my app, you can see that it has all the same files that you saw on the base GitHub repo. Um, and if I type volo serve, it comes with a development server. So I can just type volo serve, and I'm already running another one. Hold on. There you go. Now if I go to localhost, eight thousand eight, which is the default port, um, this is the list detail template which should be, really, it's mobile optimized for now. Um, so you, you get this whole app within like five seconds. And this is a list detail app that you can click on an item, and it drills down into the details. You can edit the thing. 
and save it, and it updates it throughout the whole app. Um, so we're these list detail templates are ones that we're still kind of actively working on. So we're calling them beta because um, they come with this layouts library, which I wrote, um, which is my experiment into how to write apps um, and how to how to figure out the user interface for the apps and the easiest way to specify a user interface and work with it. Um, I'll go into more detail about that later. I just wanted to show you the Volo commands. So now if I, if I made that app, I can type Volo build, which builds my app, and, uh, and all of this, all that this does is it um, concatenates, minifies JavaScript, and does all that kind of stuff that you should do um, for a, a app, because you, you really want to concatenate all, all of your JavaScript and CSS into one file, um, or one individual file for CSS and JavaScript, and also minify it, because it's just going to significantly reduce the load for your app. There's another command called vh or uh, volo gh deploy, which actually deploys it straight to GitHub, and it asks you the name of it if you haven't deployed it yet before, um, and it throws it up on GitHub using the, their Pages service, which is a free hosted service, um, and there it is. I've already hosted my app, so if I go to that URL, it's there. Um, and you can see that the URL is jlongster.github.com slash my app. So, th so this is a real hosted app. Um, and you can see that it's hosted by, I can try to go to the manifest.web app file. And it's there. Um, GitHub is cool because they, they implemented the web app extension. So their, their service actually serves up the web app with the right correct MIME type. So I could actually pass that URL into the marketplace and submit my app right now. Um, so that's kind of the whole idea about Mortar, is to get this really quick development process going. Um, it comes with a few other things, like an installation button. Like, I think Rob mentioned that installation API. Um, but all, all that you have to do with Mortar is uncomment a div that's class button install or something, and you get this big blue button that you can style more yourself if you want to. And that button, if you click it, it installs the app. That's literally all you have to do. You don't even have to worry about the JavaScript. Um, so we're trying to bundle in things that we find are going to be common things for every single app um, and create more specific templates for a little bit more specific apps and try to be somewhat opinionated, somewhat helpful, but still let you choose a lot of things that, that you want to do. Because if, if you notice that w right now at this point, it doesn't come with any kind of um, user interface library, like widgets library or something like that. And that might be something that we do at some point, but we're trying to be really careful about being too specific, because we want you guys to use this. If you want to use another UI library like jQuery UI, um, we don't want to, we, we want you to be able to take advantage of this, but still use other stuff that you want to. So are there any questions about that? Because um, I have a bunch of other slides I want to go through real quickly, but I wanted to, to set that in the context of Mortar. Um, so I'll, I'll pause for a second if anybody has any questions about that. Okay. Um, so I think the thing that I think about, when I think of web apps, I think probably the thing that matters the most is, perfor is performance. Um, and really the, the more important thing is perceived performance. Um, I think that's kind of a critical difference because even, even native apps have a problem of when you start up an app, it takes like two seconds to load. Um, and that's why I always implemented the thing where you can actually have a default image which the minute that you load up your app, even when it has the animation, when it's coming in, that image is there already. And it makes the user really feel like it's loaded instantly. Even though it's not, it takes like two seconds for everything to kind of um, lay out and maybe JavaScript needs to bind some buttons. But um, the, the user really needs to feel like whenever they have a user interaction with their app, that it happens instantly, even though it most likely doesn't. Um, I think there's a lot of these tips and techniques kind of revolve around this. Um, we, need, we need to find a way for things to be performant. And really, really, I think the web is ready for this. Um, there's a lot of, there's some JavaScript performance things. This isn't really dealing with that. This is more just the app needs to feel performant. Um, and I've, I've been trying to think about why this is and why the web hasn't met this problem a whole lot yet, um, at least back in like 2005 when we were just writing websites. And I think one difference is, of course, we're probably writing web apps which are going to be run on low-end phones. Um, so that's one thing. And I think the other thing is that apps are much more stateful. Um, they are typically written in a way that the page just, just does, does not refresh at all. 
Um, so there is like a bar that is always there and a button is pressed on that bar and like a different view slides in. Um, that's a much different way of writing a website than when we did it back in 2005 where we just wrote pages and then you clicked on links to traverse to the website. Um, clicking a button on a navigation bar should not be the same as clicking a link. It should feel faster. Um, and it's kind of, you know, I mean, th there's, I think you just have to figure out your use case. I don't think you should go too, too, too overboard with it. Like a blog probably shouldn't be an app unless you have a million readers and you really want to provide a cooler interface or something. Um, but web apps need to feel like they are instantly giving you some feedback after you tap something. So like I said, page refreshes are rare. Um, a web app typically um, is tighter, tighter, more, more, more integrated into the hardware level. Like it has a bunch of the APIs that Robert was uh, specifying. Um, web apps typically tie, tie into those. And I think that's why we're just now starting to see those because previously the web hasn't had a whole lot of hardware hardware level integration. Um, and I think it's especially important for phones. It's kind of forcing us to do that. And it just has a bunch of other stuff like notifications and more a more structured UI, like I said, um, which does not refresh. And um, it's just, it's a much different paradigm than a typical website with links. So we need to figure out how we can achieve this. So I think HTML5 is ready. Um, we talked about show stoppers, which I think is important. I think it's ready with the right techniques. Um, Hopefully, as, as the years go on, we can kind of get some of these techniques by default. Um, right now, we kind of have to do a few techniques that make sure things happen the right way because we know things are implemented in browsers a certain way. Um, I hope in the future that it's, it's going to even be better. It's going to even be easier. Um, like, for example, Cincha did that Fastbook thing, which um, implemented the Facebook stuff in a HTML5 web app, which is cool. Um, if you look at how they did it, it's a little bit crazy. Um, they had to, as you're scrolling through your newsfeed, they actually have to dynamically only show the DOM elements that are on screen, and everything above and below it does not actually exist. Um, and they do some crazy hacks for that. And so it's, it's ready with, with some pretty specific techniques. Um, so this is my tip, tip number one. Um, for, for your web apps, you should never really ever use the click event. Because what happens on a phone is um, when it's or on any touch interface is the click event basically says when the user taps something, they wait up say like a hundred milliseconds um, and then and then they fire the event. And they do that because they, they need to disambiguate between uh, single taps and double taps. And for example, like on most uh, mobile browsers, if you double tap a browser, it kind of zooms into that content. Um, that's why they can't fire the click event in totally right, right, right when you touch the screen because it needs to disambiguate between all these other events. However, luckily there is a touch events API that you can use that uh, fires immediately. There's a touch start, a, there's a touch start um, event that fires immediately when you touch the screen. A touch drag or a touch, a touch move, um, a touch leave, touch enter, and a touch end. Um, using those APIs, you can implement something that is very, very fast. Um, so typically. Um, so just as an example, um, the left one simulates a touch by waiting 100 milliseconds to fire the event, and then the right one um, fires it fires it right when I touch it. So if you if you see the difference, I'm not sure. It's it's very different for me because I'm actually uh, I, I need to fix that. Um, it's a lot different for me. So I click, and there's that slight lag. But on the touch one, if I click or I click, um, it's just instant. And it doesn't seem like that big of a deal, but when you go through a whole app and a lot of your buttons are firing 100 milliseconds later, it just it just gives a bad feeling. It feels laggy. It's not laggy. It just feels laggy. Um, so that's something that you really need to be careful of. A quick thing that you can do is, um, I think this is a pretty well vetted technique to detect if you're touch friendly, um, but you can check for the on touch start event in this document dot document element. Um, I think this fails on some older Android devices, so there's um, you can look around for, for other ways of, of seeing it if it doesn't work. Um, but if, if you if you basically on on this condition, if this if it's touch capable, you uh, set, set set the click event variable to the touch start event, and if it's not, then you set it to the click event, and then you just use that variable throughout all of your handlers. Um, that will fire immediately whenever the user touches a button. Now there's there's a caveat to this. Sometimes you may not want it to immediately fire when you start, like when the touch starts. 
Um, for example, for the, the in the list detail app, for that list, I actually implemented something which um, you actually can't fire it immediately because when the touch starts on a list item, the user could be dragging the list. So it actually has to wait. Um, it waits a little bit, or it's actually, it, I think it actually fires on touch end. Um, but it has some special logic in there to make sure that the, the list item is highlighted after like 50 milliseconds when the touch starts because it makes it feel like you did tap the item. But if you're dragging, um, then it, the touch started, but then you dragged, and then it cancels like, a, oh, he's, he's not clicking, so don't select the list item. Um, so there's, there's some tricky things that for your use case, you're probably gonna have to use the full touch API um, to make it feel responsive. Um, and it's, it's, it's part of the, the going back to, there should be some visual feedback for every single user interaction. Um, because whenever somebody touches something, even if you don't immediately open something or immediately change something, you need to immediately um, make the button glow or change the background color or something to make it feel responsive, to let the user know that you are understanding what they're doing. Um, so something else, uh, like I said before, you should avoid refreshing the entire page, which feels weird as a web developer, um, but that's just how you write apps. Um, because when you refresh the entire page, it's got to re-download everything, which could be cached, but it, the, the browser still has to parse everything, parse the JavaScript and set up everything. Um, this, this whole, my, my whole slide thing is never refreshing the page when I go to the next slide. And it's interesting because, because, because of that, I can have these cool animations that go between pages. Um, and apps are just like that. People expect that. And it feels good. And it feels nice. It's, it's a good user experience. Um, this, unfortunately, mortar right now, which is something that I des definitely need to fix, um, it does not change the URLs whenever you change slides. Um, and there's a history API that allows you to actually change the URL without changing the page. Um, that, le that lets you say, hey, I'm at writing web app slash two. Um, so you don't need to even use the pound or any of those hacks. And I think, I think it's pretty well supported. Um, so if you're not refreshing the entire page, how do you get new, new, new content? Um, well, you can either Ajax load sections, which you would basically have a spinner when you show the page, which would kind of look like this. Oh, for some reason my spinner GIF isn't working right now. But there was a spinner there. Um, I think it's a, it, the Ajax thing isn't working on the GitHub pages. So um, that's, that's kind of unfortunate. But you could have a spinner that is showing, telling the user, I'm loading something. And then when that page loads in, then you actually dump the content into it. But um, the important thing is that the page slid in immediately when the user pressed the button. Um, even there's there's some native apps that I know that do this, like the Verge has a native app, and as you're clicking through their sections, there's a big spinner that is going while it's loading the content. Um, you can also, which is what Mortar does right now, um, you can dump your whole app on the first load, which sounds like it, it would be slow, um, and it probably is slower, but at least every single thing is immediately there whenever the user clicks on something. Um, this is something that we're still going to work on too. I'm not sure exactly. This is again part of probably your use case. You could probably have like your about page always there, but a, a more heavier page you might want to load in on demand when the user goes to that. Um, but it's just, it's just something to think about because uh, it's definitely faster than refreshing the whole page. Um, so yeah, I was going to say something else, but um, so this is an, another big thing too. Since um, native apps have this tendency to have animations, which I think is a better user experience than just having things randomly appear, if something slides down and it just takes like 50 milliseconds for that, for that to happen, um, it just it just feels nicer. It's just a better user experience. It shows the user that that your app is actually running, um, and uh, there's there's some important things that you need to do to to achieve smooth smooth animations. One thing is definitely do not use jQuery's animate. Because unless they've changed it recently, um, I believe that it still uses JavaScript on a set timeout or a set interval and changes the position or changes your object um, in JavaScript. So it's firing JavaScript events every single time it wants to change something. So it's not, it's, it's not accelerated at all. Um, you should use CSS3 transitions and animations um, to achieve that. I'll show you that in a JS Piddle. Um, so this is a simple animation. Um, I think it's so cool because CSS is such a cool 
way to describe um, the looks of, of objects, and it's got tons of different properties. And animations, I think, practically work on almost all of them. So if I wanted to change the color, so you can see that it has, has a background color of kind of a green. Um, and then I define a CSS3 animation with the at keyframes. Um, and I said at 50%, at change the width to this much. And then at 100%, um, put it here, change the width and height, and then also change the background color to red. So if I run that, um, you can see at 50%, tall and skinny red, and then it gets wider again. Um, this is all this is all that code right there. Like that's that's it. And what's really nice about using CSS is not only is it really expressive, um, it also lets the engine do it. Like it lets the engine accelerate the animation. Um, and one one other small note is to not do not use top left if you're going to be moving stuff, because um, with the current implementation of browsers, uh, it actually accelerates using um, transformations more. So it's actually, if you use this transform, which is a, another CSS3 thing, um, transform translate and giving it an XY should be semantically exactly the same as saying position relative top left, um, which is what you could do if you wanted to move an element at once um, or just just once. But if that, ever, if that element is ever going to move and you want to move it from this position to that position, always, always, always use translate. And um, because what, what happens on the browser level is it actually it actually creates some kind of accelerated layer. And the, re, the way that it just repaints and animates the object is a whole lot smoother. Um, and in most browsers, it actually happens off the main thread, which is a really important point. Because even if there's disk I.O. or something, um, it's literally silky smooth because it's completely a different thread. Um, I think on Firefox's desktop, unfortunately, it's not off the main thread yet. But there is work going on. With that, but on all of the mobile stuff, um, Firefox or Android, Firefox OS, it um, it is off the main thread. So I've got. So if you if you go back to this uh, list detail app, these uh, these animations where you're what so slow. Um, these animations where it slides. Why is my um, it slides on those next views. Um, that's using a transform and a translation, and that's going to be silky smooth even on my BGG phone. And I, if you're uh, if you want to see it on this, come up to me afterwards. Um, I don't have that fancy thing installed where I can mirror it, or else I'll show you guys. Um, but it's it's really cool seeing seeing this app working on my phone. And it's I have to be a little bit more careful because sometimes uh, if you don't sometimes if there's a little bit of lag. When you start the animation, because it has to recalculate something, um, it'll start a little bit late. But once it starts, it's silky smooth. So as long as I make sure that it's um, starting right when you press the button, then you're going to get a really smooth animation. It's just going to feel it's just going to feel really nice. Um, I believe it acts the same as position relative. So it's it's uh, relative to where it was. Um, I think, I'm not sure what happens if you say position absolute. I can try it right now. I kind of feel like you probably need to specify a top left absolute, and then I'll start it with a transform of 10. So let's see if that starts there, or if it and actually, it does seem to, to to do the same thing. It uh, it probably does it relative to its parent. Um, I don't I don't have a parent thing right here, but it's I'm I'm assuming if it's position absolute, that's going to mean that it's relative to its parent. Yeah. Yeah. Supposedly, I was actually talking to uh, there's some guys here, which was great, um, who actually work on the accelerated layers and GPU acceleration of the various things. Um, it was awesome because like it's sit down with them at lunch and be like, how does this work? Like, why is this faster? Um, and I, I asked them the difference between position relative and top left, and the difference between that and translate x, y. Um, and they were like, the transform is just 10 years younger. I mean, the, the top left was just something that they did 10 years ago. So semantically, it should be exactly the same. Um, but the important thing to note at this case in most browsers is that the translate, the transform is actually a good bit more accelerated, even though 
theoretically, they could accelerate the other ones at some point, too, if they can deduce that it's a certain, the top left transformation is the exact same. Um, they could accelerate that, but for some reason at this point, uh, you should just use transforms. I mean, there's, there's really no reason not to. Because um, you can also do awesome things like this, too. You can go ahead and like add rotation to it and do a little... And, you know, do a little flip if I can get it to work. Ah, oh, come on. This worked an hour ago. There you go. So, yeah, that's kind of cool, right? Um, so the transforms are ultimately a lot more flexible than, um, than doing just a, a top left. So um, I actually wrote for, for Mortar, I noticed having to, to move those views left and right and around. I was actually working with the CSS3 keyframes a lot with, from JavaScript. Um, and I ended up needing to write a library to be able to construct these CSS3 keyframes from JavaScript because it's a little annoying because you can see in the CSS3, I don't know if it's a little bit too small, um, that it's kind of this special syntax. It's at keyframes. Um, and so, like, that's kind of hard to query from, from JavaScript. There is, there is a DOM API to query from, from JavaScript, but it's really, con it's really convoluted to get different keyframes and to, like, set a, a property in a keyframe. Um, so if you're interested, I wrote this library called cssanimations.js that let you easily, um, all you have to do is call CSS, cssanimations.get, it gets that animation, and then you can change a property in the 100% keyframe to a background color red. Um, so this is nice because animations are cool because um, there's, there's, there's animations and there's um, transitions. Transitions, like you can set a transition colon, and then um, on, a, on, a, on an element, say, for the color, for the property color, set a transition of five seconds with this timing function, and when that class is matched onto a onto a DOM element, like if you said in JavaScript or something, set that class name to the DOM element, um, it would it would initiate that transition. It basically says for this, um, I probably could just show you. Basically, if I had dot box dot red. Um, I could say background color red. It's not spelled right, but um, and then you just say transition. I think that's right. Red three seconds, something like that. Um, so this is basically a way of saying for for my properties in my current CSS selection, um, when this selection is met. Um, instead of just applying them immediately, transition them for three seconds. So it would transition the background color to red over three seconds. So in JavaScript, if I set the, um, the box to red, which I'm not sure if this is gonna, I wish this evaluated instantly. Um, I could use JSBin, but that's okay. Um, then it's so basically the transitions is are a way of saying um, for for my current properties do a transition, but the animations are cooler because they don't they allow you to also specify a from, whereas the transition only basically lets you specify a to, meaning that like for these properties when these are going to these properties use this transition, but it assumes that where it was before that's what it's transitioning from, whereas the animations are cool because you can actually say um, you know keyframes zero percent. Uh, that's not it. Um, Zero percent, and you can set properties in here, and you can say starting here uses animation to here. So I find it a lot more powerful, especially when doing uh, native or native style UIs or web app style UIs. Um, I find it more powerful because it's a lot easier to um, kind of rational rationalize about what's happening with your animations. You don't always have to make sure to set something back to a certain place before you set a transition. So that's just a quick note. If you're if you're wanting to do a lot of animations, that that might be helpful. Okay. Sure. Uh, maybe a trick question. But do you know, like, on iOS, for instance, when you translate, you need to do the reading to get the hardware accelerated. Right. Um, 
Yeah, Rob's question was, um, like, do I know about on, did you say specifically iOS, yeah. Safari? Yeah, that um, you need to set a transform. You can do 3D transforms as well. And on, Safari, or on iOS, people are saying that you should set uh, a transform of translate 3D zero, which essentially tells it you're applying a 3D transform, which does nothing. And supposedly that GPU accelerates the, the element or something with that. Um, I had a long conversation with the graphics guys here over lunch, and they were like, that's terrible. Because <laughs> basically, uh, I mean, from a pure standpoint, you shouldn't ever have to worry about that kind of stuff. But from a current practical standpoint, you might find some improvements over it. But you're, you're kind of binding yourself into something. They, they might change it later on, because you're essentially saying, you're essentially forcing it to, you're controlling how it does graphics memory. So if you set that on an element, it's having to like slice it out of it, uh, its current graphics buffer and give it its own graphics buffer. So if you do that to a lot of elements, you're actually going to override, you're going to fill up the graphics memory, and it's actually going to be slower. So I would, I would give you that technique hesitantly. Um, I think the transform, I don't really know what the difference between that, doing the 3D transforms, and just using transform, the 2D transform. Really? Uh, okay. Right. That's true. That's true. Yeah, there. I mean, you could use the 3D transforms certainly to actually do something. Um, I would re recommend not not buying into the philosophy a whole lot of just randomly doing it because um. Yeah, it was funny talk talking to these guys. They were like, "No, that's bad. Shouldn't do that." But um. So yeah, there's um there's a lot of interesting things out there for for animations. Um, I think it's one of the coolest things you can do to an app is just add a little bit of feedback with animations. And, Things like that. It just makes it feel nice. So, yeah, that's true. Right. Yeah, is that it, it? It is better. It gives you 500 milliseconds to load something, you know. So it's it's interesting. So um, another another technique is um, so right now Mozilla is basically just focusing on mobile. Like, we're, we're totally investing in Firefox OS, which is great. But I think within the next year, especially within the next two years, you're going to see us trickling down a lot of those things into desktop. Um, so it's, it really wouldn't hurt to go ahead and start thinking multi-device. Um, I mean, you're going to be writing a website anyway. And the whole point of doing this is to be cross-platform, right? And if anything, your app is going to be viewed on tablets, even if it's never going to be really a desktop kind of an app, because it just doesn't make sense. Um, tablets are just as big as a small desktop. So um, there are things that you can do to make sure that it's responsive, which means that a site actually scales when, you, uh, when it's seen on different devices. Um, one of the most important things you can do is use relative font sizes. Um, and EMs, Ms, whatever, is, um, that's like the, the tried and true rule that basically says uh, on the body you can say, um, you can even say like font size is 14 pixels or uh, you probably use M's there as well, and I think it does it relative to the operating system or the default size that the user has set in the browser. And then for all of the other elements that are that inherit from like the body, like all of the all of the um, tags underneath it, it's going to inherit that font size. So if you say um, 0.5 em, that's half the font size of your parents' font size. So if you if you make the body font size a lot bigger, your whole site just gets bigger too. Whereas if you use pixel fonts. It's 12 pixels no matter what. Um, so that, that makes it really responsive and uh, just gives it a lot more flexibility as you are going to be writing apps seen on different screens. Um, I found out an, another unit, which I had no idea about until like a week ago, um, from the venerable Potch. I don't know if any of, any of you know Matt, Matthew Clay Potch. Um, he talked about the same stuff in Mountain View like two weeks ago. But evidently, there's a unit, v, VW and VH, and those units are actually, VW is one one hundredth of your screen's width and VH is one one hundredth of your screen's height. So basically it lets you set like a percentage, like 50 V 
50 VW would be 50% of your actual browser's width, no matter what, even if it's all the way down inside your app um, and your parent has a tiny font size, you can actually set something to a VW. And this, I, I probably should say that this is probably more uh, applicable to just like DOM elements, not, not font sizes. But if you wanna set like a width on something that is exactly half of your screen size, um, VW and VH are really, really interesting. And I've, I should have linked to the, to the Indian article about it, but you can probably search for it and find it. Um, to play around with this though, I actually wrote this whole thing. I set a, a, v, I set a font size in the VW units on the body for this presentation. And then in the whole body, I use M's. So it's inheriting the font size from, from the body, right? So technically, theoretically, if I move my, my browser, everything just inherits from that body uh, VW size, which is kind of fascinating. And I've never seen anybody say, this is how you should make a responsive site. So I'm not sure if this is really a good thing to make your whole site responsive. Um, Seems to work really well for this, though. Um, we could just do that all day. Um, don't what? The 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 VW? Yeah. You know, also it's, rent instead of VMs. So relative VMs yeah. or um, retina displays. Okay. Yeah, that's that, that's true. There, there's also R R E M, which is relative M's, which I think does not inherit from your parent. I think it's like from the top level, it will use that EM. Um, so evidently the Firefox OS sub is already using this stuff too. Um, Mortar does not use v VWs or do anything kind of like that for you. Uh, there's other things it does to make your site responsive, which I'll talk about later. So it's, it's something to keep in mind. There's a, whole, there's a whole bunch of articles out there, I'm sure, about how to do responsive sites. Um, I wouldn't go and use this technique right now. I, it worked really well, but I don't know how, how well it works. I've never seen anybody su suggest it. The, the real way that you should make your site responsive are using media queries, um, which is something I won't go into too much, but it's basically a way in CSS to say, if the screen is less than 400 pixels, then apply these properties, and you can completely change the layout. So kind of in line with performance, um, are, is the fact that you should, you should try to reduce your memory a lot um, because the smaller your memory fo footprint is, of course, the faster your app's going to be, the faster it's going to load. Um, there are several ways. This is kind of a vague thing. Unfortunately, there's not a great memory profiler right now for Firefox. Um, but it's just, it's more of a general thing, I think, that you should just not try to construct a bunch of DOM elements every single time somebody does something. You should either cache them or try to reuse DOM elements. Um, and I, I think a, a good use case, which I was recently working on, was for, for really long lists, like say in the B2G Contacts app, it could be like a thousand long list um, of DOM elements. Every DOM element has a bunch of properties and stuff to it. Um, it's just not very scalable. I mean, that's going to get sluggish the more and more contacts somebody has. It's going to get sluggish to, to swipe it up and down. It's going to get sluggish to, uh, to tap a, a contact and have it slide into the details because um, it always has to be repainting and reflowing everything. So if the whole DOM is fully expanded, um, it's just not going to scale well. So something that we've been trying to figure out how to do is actually only show, and this is something the Sentry guys who did with Fastbook, but you only have the DOM nodes exist that would be seen on the, on the actual screen. All of the other DOM nodes above and below it just don't, aren't even there. Um, and that makes a total constant memory and uh, computationally wise, just totally constant. Um, so it's a little bit difficult to do because you don't want to mess up the scroll bar. I'm still trying to figure out how to do it. Um, but that's just, uh, it's just an example use case about how you can optimize something and how HTML is ready if you put the work into it. Um, I mean, I'm not sure exactly how, because I, I, I know that iOS is exactly the same thing. If you're having a table view, which is what they call it, and you're adding cells, it forces you to reuse the cells, and it doesn't, it doesn't construct the whole list. Um, so if you're writing native apps or web apps, you're going to have to do this. Um, there's, there's no magical solution. This isn't something that's going to go away in a few years. So you just have to put in the work for it. Another small note is to always, always compress and concatenate your resources, like your CSS and JavaScript, which I, I mentioned that before. But mobile is not only uh, slower on bandwidth and it's probably slower on the network, uh, it's slower to process things as well. Um, so if you concatenate all your CSS, have them at the very top, 
and concatenate and minify your JavaScript and have it at the bottom, you're going to have a site that loads really fast, shows something really fast, and the JavaScript is going to um, hook, hook everything up. And you're supposed, there's actually ways to optimize images as well if you want to reduce bandwidth. Um, you can run something, there's like a PNG crusher, and there's, there's other ways to optimize PNGs, which evidently cut out a bunch of stuff that your image doesn't actually use, and it evidently can cut it down like half the size. I haven't actually used that yet, though. Um, so offline stuff is kind of a different beast. Um, like somebody else mentioned, there's app cache. I'm not going to go too much into it. Volo actually has an app cache command, which is also kind of in beta. <laughs> um, because it essentially just sees all of, because we're fully client-side app, you can fully see all the files that, that you're going to use. Um, so it's able to, why is that read? I need, um, so it's, it's actually able to guess at which, it just kind of caches all of the files. So if I look in built and see the app cache, this is the cache manifest that it, that it created. Um, and it's kind of all of your files. I, I didn't actually write this, so I'm not sure how applicable this is. I haven't spent too much time thinking about this, but it's an interesting idea. Um, and with the app cache, you like have to give it a unique, like you actually have to change the app cache whenever you update it. So it, it automatically takes care of that for you and everything like that. Um, so that's, that's one technique that has worked for some apps. For other apps, for some reason, it didn't work as well. Um, Rubhawks just recently wrote an app cache generator as well which um, I haven't used either, but it looks pretty sweet. You just type in URL and it gives you an app cache. Um, and there's a link here that specifies how you test for updates. Uh, the app cache is interesting because it basically you're saying which files the browser should never download again until you update it. Um, so it's completely available offline. Um, so there's, there's an API for listening when there's an update ready and you need to tell the user that there's an update ready and get them to refresh the page, and when it refreshes the page, if you do everything right, it re-downloads the updated files. Um, that's kind of a short summary of it. It's a little bit tricky, but it's doable. Um, so Rob showed you the manifest that web app, so I won't go too, too, too much into it. There's a, few, there's a few links here that might help you. Um, this is a JSON lit validator. JSON is a kind of a subset of JavaScript. It's very, very picky, though, like you can't you, um, all of the properties in, a, in the JavaScript hash for object um, has to be quoted. Um, otherwise, you're going to get errors when you try to upload your app to the marketplace. Um, JSON lit will tell you the exact errors that you have in your, in your JSON file. And then, um, like Rob mentioned before, too, there's also a validator that is hosted from, from the marketplace where you can type in your manifest.web and it will actually tell you, like, your locales look weird or something, or you're missing and you're actually missing a field. So I, I kind of already showed you Mortar, um, and you were you sh you were showed the Firefox OS simulator earlier this morning. Um, how much time do I have? Should I keep going? I mean, I, I could show a little bit more. Yeah, I can. Okay. Okay, cool. Well, that's good because um, that's enough time to show you some of the layouts that I've been doing. Um, so for. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I was going to transition back to, to mortar a little bit because that's kind of what I'm supposed to be talking about. Um, but I mean, if there if you have a question, just tell me. I, I want this to be interactive. This isn't presentation as much as a discussion. So that's true. <laughs> Good point. Um, oops. Um, So the, like I mentioned, the um, the mortar collection comes with four different templates. The app sub template is kind of what I showed you, um, and I also showed you the list detail template, which is the app sub template just with a our layouts library included and some initial HTML that implements that list list detail app. Um, it's it's really not much lines of code. Um, there's also a game sub template which is kind of new. Um, it's really pretty boring right now. I mean, if you if you look at it, like, like this is what it is. Like, you can move the box with your keys. So, you know, I guess some people could be entertained by that. But um, we're planning on implementing probably image image loading and like basic basic 2D collision detection. Which 2D collision detection, the basic form is easier than you think. It's just testing whether two 
rectangles overlap each other and they can fire an event. Um, and you can go really far with, with what this has right now, which is input and a game loop and maybe a few other things and image loading and basic, basic 2D collision detection. It's surprising how far you can go with that. And all of that is probably only like 100 lines of JavaScript. Um, I mean, I can actually show you the, uh, the JavaScript, but it's, it's not even trying to make it into a complicated framework or anything. This is really just for you to learn how, to, how a game works. So you have your player, which is, you know, you have an X, Y, and size. Um, reset, pause, unpause. The update loop, which checks if the input is down, then you update the player a little bit far down and all, and all the other ones. A render function, um, and then this is your main game loop. And it uses request animation frame, which you should always use, because um, instead of set interval, because it actually tells the browser, I want this to be an animation and be shown at a good enough speed to where it looks like an animation. But if it doesn't have to be rendered, then it, it's not going to render it. So, um, so this is this is the whole game thing. And if we add maybe 30 lines of JavaScript, which does resource loading and 2D collision detection, um, that's all this would be. And I think people would be able to write some really simple games and be fun. Um, so the list detail and the tab view template, um, the tab view is basically the same as the list detail. It just shows you that with the layouts library, um, you can have this other bar down here, which this needs some design love. Don't judge. Um, this is kind of still being worked on. Um, so there's these buttons down here, which you can switch to, switch to different sections. Um, it doesn't have an animation or anything because you're switching sections. And it could slide, possibly. Um, but it needs to feel different than this, which is this is actually diving down into the items. Um, and the layouts library keeps track of a stack. So if you say, if you when I push this list button, um, it's saying open this list view. Um, and by that, it means it slides on and it adds it to a navigation stack. Because you added it to a navigation stack, it automatically adds a back button. So that back button is not there in the markup. It just adds it automatically. When you press back, it goes back to the previous view. Um, so this, this navigation stack is a frequent uh, UI paradigm with apps. Um, so it kind of automatically handles all that for you. So the one last thing I will show you is how uh, is how that actually looks and how cool it is because it's it's actually surprisingly simple. Um, there's a new there's there's a new spec coming up which is the web component spec, which is a really interesting spec because it basically allows you to start implementing your own HTML tags and it, it took me it took me a while to figure out what that even means. Um, essentially, I can have a so I I created a tag called X view. Um, and you can actually do that, and I think it, think it validates. Maybe it gives a warning, but it doesn't throw an error. Um, but you, so, so you can do this, and in browsers that don't, doesn't know anything about what the XView is, I think it just defaults to a div. It just kind of assumes it's just a block level thing. Um, what the web component spec allows you to do is it, a, is it provides a way to, it's, there's a JavaScript API to where you can add hooks that say when the DOM parser hits this, it actually gives you an event when that happens. So I can say, I'm going to define this X view tag. And when the DOM hits it, I'm going to actually automatically expand it and do whatever setup I need. Instead of, like, if you look at the Twitter bootstrap, like, you always have to call, like, for, like, a modal or something, you say, like, div class equals modal. And then in your JavaScript, you always have to say, like, select the element and then call it dot modal. And that creates the modal. For X tags, you don't even have to do that. You just say X modal. Um, and we're, this is kind of new, and we're still figuring out how to use this, because I, I personally believe that you can go way overboard with this. You really should not do that. Um, some, some other guys who are, who are working on some stuff, I think, are making too many tags. It's just way too confusing. Um, so I, I try to boil it down to two tags. There's an X view tag, and there's an X list view tag, which is just like an X view, except it just implements a little bit more specific um, behaviors that a list would be. And uh, this uses this this uses a library called X tags, which is a polyfill for the web component spec. Um, there's other things in the in the web component spec, but I'm not going to go into them now. The the main thing that I take advantage of is the custom DOM elements. Um, so so this is a, a polyfill that actually works back to IE eight or nine or something like that. It works and and it works cross browser. Um, so so we can start doing this now. Um, and Firefox, I think, is currently implementing the web component spec. So I think in the next three months or something, we should actually see it native. 
which means it's even faster to expand DOM elements and stuff like that. Um, the thing that's really neat though is that I can just write this X view. And I was I was gonna write a quick app, but I think I'm probably getting close to the end of my time. So um because it's really easy to write this view because I can just say X view. And if I if I include a, a footer and a header, or or a header, it's just both the header and the footer are both optional. Um, it automatically creates this basically. The the X view fills up its parent container to 100% within height, and the header automatically becomes a static header, and the footer becomes a static footer. So, in the list detail view, oh wait, is this still running? Um, so if if you notice, uh, it's not still running. This is still running. Um, you notice that if I zoom this slower, see see how the scroll bar is just in the content section. This header up here is totally static, um, and that's that scroll bar. It always kind of irks me when people do like a position fixed, which technically works, but the scroll bar doesn't look right. Like the scroll bar should tell you that it's only working on on this content. Um, so all of that just automatically works for you. The the other main benefit is in, in X view. It actually uses Backbone. Um, in the back end. So in XView, it actually always automatically constructs a backbone view for you as well. And what that means is that um, I can, that's how, that's how it does all of this stuff. So if I add an item, then I can immediately just say add. And you notice, I don't know if that probably wasn't a good UI, it probably needs a glow or something, but it actually added it to the list. And if I click on it, then it goes down, down here into the view. Um, and it's able to propagate those changes because of backbone. Um, you can actually say, uh, if I go into the JavaScript of it, uh, it doesn't work. Um, um, then, know how I'm getting the list view, which which you can see is this X list view. And I actually get get the raw DOM element, so I'm using Zepto to to get it. But then I actually using get get zero is the same as bracket zero. It returns the actual DOM element, and I can actually call list dot add on the element, and it adds it to a backend collection in the in the uh, in the backend. And all I have to do is pass it a normal JavaScript object, which can be anything, um, any arbitrary keys or values, and uh, it adds it to the view. So now that I've added two items or actually add 10. Um, the detail view, I actually get that, and then I set a render function on it. And that render function gets an item, which is the item that was selected, and then I can uh, basically render it into the view. The view content can be anything you want to. It doesn't force anything on you. Um, it's similar to a div in that way. Like, you can put anything in it. It just has these kind of magical constructs that do a bit of magic that help out a lot. Um, so for me, I just select the title, description, and date, and I just get them from the item, and I just set them in there. You'll probably want to do some more stuff for that. Um, and then the edit view, it renders it. It actually renders it into a form. For some reason, my full screen's not working. Um, it just renders it into the form, and uh, I think it adds button.add is the event, which it just binds an event onto the function. There's nothing really special there. And then it gets the properties that you added, and then it says, if I'm adding something, um, that means that model does not exist, um, then do list.add and add the item that was from the form. Um, if the model does already exist, then I'm setting it. Um, and then I just close edit. So every single X view has, um, if you look at the mortar layouts, uh, mortar layouts um, project, there's a whole documentation in the README about all of, all of the API that, this, uh, that these views give you which are, um, like the X view has a title field, a render, a get title, um, model and on, and on open, and just various events that you can watch for these views that happen. And the X list view has the add function and a few other things to it. Um, so that it just kind of, it makes it feel like I'm solving something that I think most apps are going to hit. Um, it takes away some of the grunt work that you have to do to actually make sure you're data is propagated throughout your whole app and when you do that kind of stuff because you're never refreshing the page, right? So you can't assume that the backend is going to render something. 
um, everything is always going to be statically on the front end. So I hope I hope that was useful. I hope I hope this view stuff and the more complicated layouts click. I mean, if it doesn't click, then definitely tell me because we need to change that. So um, yeah, are there any questions? Okay. Oh, sorry. You're right. So let's do another five-minute break.